Hello and welcome to TSG Foundation's monthly Wisdom of the Zodiac class and meditation. Today's topic is taken from Wisdom of the Zodiac, Volume 3, and that is Chapter 24, titled Scorpio, Breaking Our Identifications. November always has fond memories for me and a lot of thinking on my part about my goal and my vision in life. It holds two very important celebrations. One of them is it's November 1st, is Torquem's birthday, and that always gives me wonderful memories of birthday celebrations and fun times. And the second one is that is the date when I started thinking about establishing TSG Foundation. And it took me the entire month to prepare all the paperwork and legal proceedings to have a proper foundation. So November holds a very, very meaningful and wonderful time for me. And it also is a very meaningful time for me to think about the role that my father played in my life as a teacher, as a parent, and what are some of the things that he taught me, both as a child and as an adult. So this chapter has a lot of meaning for me and I'd like to share some of it with you today. So let me read that first paragraph and talk about some of the key points. And that is on page 273. The Scorpio full moon is a moment when great changes can occur in the psychology of the human being. So we are talking about the psychology of our life. That is the way we think, the way we feel, the conception we have of the world around us. It is a time of crisis in which man faces himself and decides to change his life. To change means to become less matter and more spirit, to have greater beauty, greater peace, greater creativity, and more discrimination. So these are the things you can think about. First, it is a time of crisis, and that already reframes the idea that we have about crisis. We think of a crisis as a time of pain and suffering, yet this is already turning that around and saying a crisis is a time in your life where your whole psychology can change. And often in our life, it takes multiple similar crises for us to awaken, does not? So the first question you can ask yourself is, how many crises do I face in my life and have I faced and what are they all telling me? Are they the same thing or are they the same kind of thing on long string of events? So it's a very important time to ask yourself that question. The second one is, what does it mean to change? To change means to change, to become less matter and more spirit. In our path of involution, we become matter. Now, on the path of discipleship, we are evolving, and eventually we will evolve consciously, which means we will become 80% spirit and 20% matter. Not only that, but we will become more inclusive. We will include more in our life. We are not leaving things behind, but including more of life in our life. So look at this. It's greater beauty, not less beauty. It's more beauty, deeper beauty, many layers of beauty, whereas on an ordinary day, we might think of beauty in terms of physical beauty or our beautiful relationships with people. There are multiple layers of beauty, spiritual beauties that perhaps we never thought about. How about greater peace? That would be something wonderful for each of us to aspire toward. Greater peace, less worry, less pain and suffering inside of us, less doubt, less cynicism. How wonderful would that be? Greater creativity. I like that because we have so many huge potentials in our life. We can't think of creativity only for people who paint or draw or sing or create music or so on. What about great creativity in everything that we do in our everyday life? So this is something to think about. And more discrimination. There are so many things we do every day that are completely wasteful of our time, makes us even more stressed out, more fearful, and we could stop. We can discriminate and see how we are going to remove things in our life that do not matter anymore, that really engulf us in matter. And how are we going to add things in our life that makes us, that make us more spirit, more full, more inclusive, more part of the greater whole. Because in the end of the day, as a disciple, we have to feel and act and be in the greater whole. Now let me read on. These next two paragraphs are very, very important and I'll read some highlights in there. One of the failures of disciples is self-depreciation. 
Many disciples have this sickness. They think they are not advancing. They are becoming ugly. They are becoming more lazy and so on, which is just the opposite is happening. Now, why does that happen to us? I thought about this great deal and I thought, ordinarily, we deal with life by pretend. We add illusions and glamours and deceptions and all kinds of things to close down our feeling. So we have all these patches around our aura that prevent the light from coming in, the truth and the peace from coming in into our life. And so when we start removing these patches one by one, all of a sudden we have a greater light coming into our consciousness, greater love coming into our heart than we had ever experienced before. And this could be disconcerting. This could shake us up a little bit. And this is why we see this happening to us and many wonderful men and women in the world who become much more sensitive, much more sensitive to what is going on in the world, and they start having self-doubt and self-depreciation. So when you start feeling that and you are really on the path of discipleship, try to stop that and say, you know, it's because I am becoming more sensitive, and as I become more sensitive, more light comes in more truth comes in, more understanding comes in, and I have to be able to see multiple layers of truth. So it's not just enough that you are becoming a greater observer of life and seeing all the stuff that's going on, but you have to start training yourself to see multiple layers of life so that you can appreciate the depth of what is going on in life and not take everything so personally and be so wounded by it. When you are enlightened, you see lots of things. It's not the truth. You see lots of things. Enlightened teachers, enlightened disciples, enlightened servers see everything that's going on in the world. They're not blind, but they know how to deal with it. You see great labor that is waiting for you, and because the field of labor is expanding, you think you are becoming less powerful and more lazy. So sometimes people see the huge vision and they say, we want to do this and this and this, and then they give up. Why is that? They feel so small in front of that labor. So all of these are huge crises for us and they come at this time of Scorpio and we have to appreciate them because that what they will do is they will force us, force us to discriminate and make choices that may seem difficult at first but all of life is about making choices in your life. You can't do everything. You can't be all things to all people. So you have to focus and decide and choose. What is it that you are going to do? And you're going to have this, do this. Look at page 274, top of the page. The first thing that Scorpio suggests to you is to have self-confidence. You're going to have self-confidence that's, yes, indeed, I can make choices. I can make the right decisions and I will do that. I don't have to do everything. And I will be satisfied by choosing one or two things that I do very well total focus. So you stand on your own feet and carry on your own battles in your own field of labor. This to me is very, very significant because I see it all the time. When people become imbued and enthused by the teachings and the spiritual traditions, they want to do all of the stuff in the world and they become overwhelmed. So you are not going to fight every battle in your life. You have to choose your battles carefully. Fight your own battles. Not only that, but when you go into battle, whether it's a physical, emotional, mental battles that you're having within yourself, make sure you can win. Make sure you are going in strategically and placing yourself in a position in life that you are going to focus and you're going to make it. This is very important. I want you to think about that. How to choose your battle and how to go into battle knowing that you are going to have a great outcome. Now let's move to page 275, the second paragraph. The energy of Scorpio tries to help you break this identification. Okay? When you break this identification, you are called a disciple. A disciple is a person who has changed his direction. He is going toward matter, but he changed his direction. Or rather, he was going toward matter, but he changed his direction. This is very important when you think about this and meditate what this means. When you break this identification, what are you identified with? 
You can be identified with all the battles in your life, with all the desires and plans and visions in your life that overwhelm you. Well, you're going to discriminate. If there's one thing that I would emphasize at this time is discriminate, discern between this person and that person, but between what are you going to focus on? What crisis are you going to focus on? What battle are you going to focus on? What choices are you going to make in your life that will result in something meaningful for you? The biggest problem that I see is disciples taking on so many things that they can't be sure of victory. So focus, 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 so that you can be sure of the outcome. Now let's go to page 277. There are beautiful, beautiful pages here, of course, read carefully. Now look at page 277. How are we going to break this limitation? The limitation of so many battles, identifications, crises, self-depreciation. These are all limitations. Limitations of going into too many things and doing them superficially instead of with depth and understanding. How are we going to do that? Well, if you're willing to do that, you're going to become a disciple and you're going to work hard. The masses are not going to break out. You see, masses of people are too interested in their material well-being. They don't care about crises and making choices, but only a few people are going to break it. And maybe that could be you. This is the job of the disciple. If you call yourself a disciple or you want to become a disciple, which means a person who is disciplined, makes the right choices, fights battles carefully and chooses which battles to fight. You have a service, you have a vision, you have something meaningful, a purpose and a direction in your life. Then you can be called a disciple or a disciple on the path. And there are nine steps that you could take at this time of Scorpio that will help you break your identifications. These are so important. Now there are nine steps here that are given, but I'm going to focus mostly on one of them today, and that is the second step, and that is on page 278. And I'm going to focus on that because of Torco, because of what he was for me, a teacher, a father. But at the end of the day, when a parent goes to the higher worlds, is long, no longer with us in the physical realm, then he is no longer really the father that we knew, but for me, he is now the teacher. And this is very important. Second step, page 278, the second step of trying to disidentify and discern what you are going to do in your life is to recognition of a teacher. Who is your teacher? And this is such a beautiful paragraph. I'm going to read this for you. And then I'm going to take it a little bit further today so that you really think and discern. How are you going to find a teacher and what are you going to do when you find a teacher? To have a teacher means literally to follow his path. Okay, we learn from many things in our life. I've learned from children and grandchildren, spouse, loved ones, parents, friends, my own work and crises in work. I've learned a lot. Those are all my teachers. But there is one teacher that I have to recognize and that's really, really important. So to have a teacher means to follow a path. It's not to zigzag all over the place, which is what is happening now in a new age and spiritual fields. People are all over the place. They have so many things that they go to. There is no discernment, no discrimination, no focus. All the battles are fought at all fronts and they become exhausted and confused. If you want to be a true disciple, you are going to find a teacher and follow that teacher and that is going to be your path. A disciple must have a teacher. I know that people say, I don't need a teacher. Well, I differ. So you're going to think about if you want to be a disciple, what does that mean? If you have a teacher, you will see how fast you will progress. A teacher is a barometer for you. A good teacher, that is. And we're going to see what the qualities of a good teacher are. A good teacher is not someone who is taking your money, making himself or herself rich at your expense, using you becoming a spiritual predator at your expense. That's not the kind of teacher we're talking about. We're talking about a teacher who gives you the process and the path and says, strive, learn, go through this process of meditation and discipline and you will find out exactly what you need to know. 
Your teacher can be a great religious teacher. It can. It can be Muhammad, Moses, Christ, Krishna, any master of wisdom. Find your teacher. Find your teacher and start following the steps that he organized for you. Then you will become a disciple. Now this teaching is not for people who just want to be all over the place. If that's where you want to be, this isn't going to be for you. If you want to focus and become a real disciple, a real conscious person, then these are the steps for them. The teacher's instructions and his presence discipline you, whether that person is in the world or out of the world. When I think of Torquem, his instructions discipline me. I follow them. Unless a teacher disciplines you, you cannot be a disciple. You see, we are so used to doing whatever we feel like doing. We think we don't need teachers, and even if we have a teacher, we feel like we can decide to follow that teacher or not. That's not the case in serious esoteric spiritual disciplines. You must have music in order to dance. Isn't that beautiful? There's a lot of meaning in that, and I um, put that for you to think about. The music is your teacher. Isn't that beautiful? So think of music, voice, becoming manifest. What is it that that teacher is playing for you that you are dancing, which is expressing, communicating, dialoguing, having an expression of who you are according to who you are, but that tone and that rhythm that is set for you by your teacher. There's something really, really significant here. A disciple is called a disciple because of his discipline. The disciple's discipline is the practice of the teacher's instructions. This was so meaningful for me, so meaningful for me rather. And it reminded me, and I went back in my notes, it reminded me of a seminar that Turkham was giving in 1991, July 20th, 1991. It was a seminar on healing, and the lecture was Healing with Beauty. And I just was reading this manuscript. It's a little bit over 870 pages. This is the new healing book that will be coming out in a, about two months or so. The end of this year, 2013, maybe beginning of next year, 2014. But he was talking about healing and somebody asked him a question. And I remember sitting in the audience and I remember that day very clearly. And then he said a few words that stayed with me always, and I will never forget them, and it was about the relationship of student to teacher. And he was saying something really, really important. Somebody asked him something about music or songs. What is the music supposed to do for us, he, the question was. And look, at I'm going to read parts of this for you because it has meant so much for me, and this has been my guiding post for my entire life since, since then. It has taken on new meaning when I was looking for when he said this, I had it in my mind, and I finally found it in the manuscript, and I said, there it is. I'm going to post this entire thing online for you so you can read it, but here are excerpts. And so the question is, Torquem, what are certain types of songs in your music that are meant to bring out certain qualities? So then he takes that question, not just to the music, but the entire concept of what is a teacher and what is a teacher trying to tell you. And he says, yes, with all humility, it is the whole universe that is to be credited for creative expressions. You see, so he's taking it out beyond that one question. Not me, not you, not anyone. This music is coming from higher levels of consciousness, from my core, and is challenging you to go to your core and discover the way to find the beauty there. Do you see how this correlates to what he just said here? He said... You're have, you must have music in order to dance, and the music is your teacher. Now think about what that means, okay? It's challenging you from your core. If you are not reading my books and listening to my music, he continues, and you are not working with the teaching presented to you, you are wasting your time by running after your tail, after mirages. Well, how many times we chase our tail and we think we're doing something so important, so just perfect for us. Well, he continues. We have women and men who have been with us for 15 or 20 years. 
and they have not even penetrated into the skin of the teaching. How sad is that? Would you like to be one of those people or do you want to be someone who has penetrated into the skin of the teaching? They are flipping, flopping outside. They're on the outside, just flailing about, running after dreams and stupidities. I do not know how to shake them and say, awaken, here is the teaching. You see what he's saying? I've got music, I've got books, I've got instructions for you, meditation lessons for you, and what are you doing? Playing. That's what he's saying. He says a lot more, and I'll read. You are saying, Torkum, you are my teacher, you are my teacher. But for 20 or 30 years, you never do what I say. Now that's an ouch. When a teacher looks at you and says that to you, you must feel something, or otherwise that person is not your teacher. What kind of teacher is that? Okay, what kind of teacher is that when we say, you are my teacher, and yet we don't do what he tells us to do? Personally, I do not say the teaching is mine. The teaching belongs to all of the great ones. All of the great ones. And he says, it is all yours. I do not take any credit for it. He says this to the great one. I am just a laborer, that is all. I am bringing the teaching to you. If you like it, take it. If you do not like it, who cares? You see, this is so important that I wanted to read it for you. And, and, it, and he goes on a lot longer in that um, part of the lecture. And what he's telling us is, focus. Focus and find out who is your teacher and what does that teacher need to have to qualify. And this brings me to these nine points. If you want to make sure you have the right teacher, first of all, make sure that that teacher is dedicated to a vision, a vision that is not his or her pocketbook, his or, or her riches, or ego, or power, or control. We see that a lot. That is not what a great teacher is all about. A great teacher is one who does not own you. He does not really care what you do or don't do. He or she will present the guidelines, the path, the music, in its many meanings, and you do the rest. And that brings us to the third step on page 278, which is a teacher, disciple, has to show detachment. You're going to learn detachment as a disciple, as a teacher. You're going to show detachment. And also, as we define what a teacher is, we have to make sure that teacher is detached. Detached. You have to be detached because you are not going to fight everybody's battles for them. You are going to empower them to fight their own battles. Okay, That's what you are going to look for in a great teacher. The next one that I look for in a teacher is service. Does that teacher serve? Torkum served. He called himself a great what? laborer. I am just a laborer. That is all. I am bringing the teaching to you and giving it to you, instructing you how to use it. The rest is up to you. You must see a huge vision of service in the teacher that you are choosing. The next one is to develop purity of motives. Teachers, disciples must have pure motives. They are not to own you. They are not to control you. They are not to manipulate you into doing things. They should be detached and totally pure of motive. It is not personal. This is very important. And he says here, page 279, check your motives. What are you, why are you looking that way? Why are you thinking that way? Why are you moving that way? Why are you writing that way? Find, try to find your deepest intention. Find the motives, and you're going to ask that for the teacher. What is that teacher's motive? If it's a wrong motive, that's not your teacher. So when you pick a teacher, the right teacher, and they have the right motive, then do what they tell you. The next one is to stand in soul consciousness. As a disciple, as a teacher, you are going to stand in soul consciousness. You are not going to fluctuate daily. What does it say? Our consciousness fluctuate daily. Sometimes we are in our stomach. Sometimes we are in our sex. Sometimes we are in our arms, legs, here, or there. We are all over the place. You are going to focus in your consciousness. And if you want to know how, we have three volumes on consciousness. Three fantastic volumes. You want to develop your consciousness. 
pick up those books and read one page a day. That's all you need to do. And see that expanded consciousness, that soul consciousness that you need to have. What does that mean? That means that every day you think about the teacher watching you. That teacher is in the soul. The solar angel and that teacher are one. And you know what to follow and whom to follow. The seventh step or the seventh quality that we're going to look for is strict control over your mouth and your tongue. It is so important. We can't be loosey-goosey with our mouth. We can't be gossiping, talking continuously and think that we are not leaking energy. We are leaking energy with our thoughts, with our mouth, with our emotions. Even if the words don't come out of our mouth, if we think it, if we feel it, it's already toxic. It's already doing its work. So you are going to really focus and look at that paragraph, the second paragraph on page 280 of the seventh step. Let me read it for you. Once you learn what is your business and what is not your business, you are on the path of discipleship. Can you imagine how many things we involve our nose into and think it's our business? Well, this is going to help you clean up your head, your mouth, your emotions, your whole energy pattern by not involving yourself in things that are not your business. You see, it's so important, but what, what do I find, for example, in myself and others? Immediately we want to solve everybody's problems. We want to tell them how to live their life. We want to give our opinion. We don't even listen half the time. So this is a whole lecture I can give just on speech, on um, having strict control over our mouth. My goodness, the things that come out of our mouths sometimes is amazing. Eighth step, eighth quality that we can look for is to be very careful that you are not tempted by dark forces. This is a huge topic again, and I'm just scanning through this quickly here. You're going to make sure stupid thoughts, criminal thoughts, mechanical urges and drives are not controlling you. Because when these are, darkness and evil can set in. It's not somebody on the outside trying to control you. It is something inside of us that finds friendship with that dark force, with that force that wants to take us into material, into fear. So you want to be sure you are not tempted by cleaning up your own house. Okay? Ninth step. I love this. I've talked about this a lot. And it is continuous striving toward perfection. I saw this in Tarkum all the time. He never stopped trying to learn how to speak better, even on the phone, how to lecture better, how to write better, how to be a better person, a better friend, a better parent. These are so important. And he said once that if you strive toward perfection every day of your life, everything you need will be given to you. This is what I see as a great teacher. A great teacher doesn't say, here, take it all and I'll chew the food for you even. No, they say, here is everything, but here is also the path to understanding. What good is 100, 150, 2,000 books in our libraries if we don't strive to understand them? So when we strive toward perfection, you are clearing your mind, your emotions, your body. You're creating a space into which the light that is shining all around you will move and find its place. When you're striving toward perfection, you are move, removing the patches of illusions and glamours that have clouded your life, prevented the light from coming in. You're removing those things and you're bringing that light in so that you can really truly understand and become a true disciple. This is what I look for in a teacher. Now look at this beautiful paragraph that I love it and I'll close with that, page 281. Do not listen to people when they try to discourage you. Don't listen. We can all succumb to that. And sometimes people that we like and love will say really discouraging, nasty things to us, can't they? Don't listen to them. Don't even listen to yourself when you're saying discouraging things to yourself. Saying you are a miserable sinner, you are going to burn in hell, you are going to lose your soul. Don't ever believe that. These things are horrible. They are meant to discourage you. Do not believe them. They are servants of darkness. I don't like those kinds of statements coming out from me or by anyone. Don't listen to them. You can never be lost because God is living within you. 
Isn't that beautiful? Always remember that you are never lost. No matter how much darkness you find yourself in, God is within you. Always stick to that God within you, always, and say, I am going to become one with you. Not one with anything else but that God within you. Scorpio is a turning point, so you can make this month a turning point in your life. Only in Scorpio do people decide to reverse their path from darkness to light, from the unreal to the real, from death to immortality, and from chaos to beauty. I love that mantra, and I'll close with that. Isn't that beautiful? So this is, this is a beautiful month for you to find where the God in you is hiding. Discriminate and discern and find who that is in you. Now let's do this beautiful meditation. And we will begin with a great invocation. And then I will ask the seed thought, what are five things that are limiting me and how can I surpass these limitations? As always, when I ask that question, you can stop the video and just do your meditation as long as it takes. You can do it with your eyes open or closed. And remember always, when you finish your meditation, at the end of all of it, take a few minutes and jot down the ideas that came into your mind and continue thinking about it all day. If you even think of one thing that is limiting you, that's plenty. So maybe you can do five things that are limiting you in a five-day meditation period. Take the day of the full moon. Two days before, take one thing that limits you and every day find a solution for the next thing that limits you and the next thing and the next thing. What are we doing when we do this? This is a very important meditation because we find ourselves, if we want to achieve a higher consciousness, initiation, discipleship, more awareness, more understanding, more peace in our life, more beauty, whatever you want to call it, we have to remove the cages that we are in. We find that we build cages and we stick in them. We stay in them. In fact, we defend the very cages that we're in, don't we? This is a profound thought. So we are going to find what are those things that limit me, limit us. One by one, we are going to see how we are going to remove them. And then we will close from with the mantra, lead us, O Lord. Okay, so sit up straight and put a nice smile on your face and just relax. And if you can't meditate with your eyes closed, just take a minute to get a pencil and paper. And as we're meditating, you can write down your ideas. You can take as long as you want. And um, this is a beautiful meditation. Okay, let's close our eyes. And we will say the great invocation. And say it with joy and meaning. And with each phrase, think of the light pouring on the world and the love pouring on the world the purpose and direction of God pouring on the world, especially at this time when there are so many crises facing people all over the world. It's really a time to bring that great light and love and divine direction so that there's peace in our hearts. Okay, let's take a deep breath. From the point of light within the mind of God. Let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men, may Christ return to earth. From the center, where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center, which we call the race of men. Let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. 
let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Now meditate on the following seed thought. What are five things that are limiting me and how can I surpass these limitations? Take one a day. So today, what is one thing that is limiting me and how can I surpass that limitation? Repeat after me. Lead us, O Lord, from darkness to light, from the unreal to the real, from death to immortality, from chaos to beauty. Let's do three silent ohms, and as we do them, think of your sound, your beautiful prayers going to every corner of the world. Thank you for joining me today. It's always a pleasure to present these beautiful teachings and meditations for you. I hope you're enjoying these books, The Wisdom of the Zodiac in four volumes. They are magnificent books. More books are coming. We are reaching the last quarter, so to speak, of completing our project and dedication to the teacher. I dedicate this work completely to Torquem and his work. His beautiful creative endeavors will never, never, ever leave us. So I hope you are enjoying these and find it in your heart to support our work in any way that you can. Thank you for joining me today and I hope to see you next time. Have a great day. Bye for now.